Welcome this afternoon to our event on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, are the critics right? Uh, uh, my name is John Mayo. I am a professor of economics, business, and public policy at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. I'm also the executive director of the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy, which I hope you'll be especially grateful to because they're the ones providing you with that wonderful lunch that you're putting in your mouth at this very moment. Uh, let me say that the role of the center is to foster discussion, debate, dialogue on issues that lie at the nexus of business and public policy. And what we, we address a number of important sectors in the economy. We tend to focus on issues involving the evolution of innovation, of regulation, and of competition. And as you might imagine, there's really nothing no public policy issue in that space that is more central today than the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So we are delighted to be able to host this event. Uh, we do hope that you come to our website and to other events that are outside of this particular space uh, because what we will try to do is bring to you the very best objective information that we possibly can. I was saying to Jason earlier that, that this is a city where information is not in short supply, but what is in short supply is clear-eyed, objective information. Our role as an academic institution is to bring that to you. Not everybody will have exactly the same voice, but the idea is to get you some credible information so that the silly ideas drop off the table and that you can have a, an honest debate about the hard, tough issues that are before this city on the economic policy. So thanks to you for coming. Uh, let me uh, say that the, today's event will be moderated by Bob Bastine, who is on the far end of the table. Bob is a senior industry and innovation fellow at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy, and he has been the director of our Georgetown on the Hill series on international trade. Some of you may have been to previous events. Uh, we think that uh, they have added a lot of uh, clarity, I hope, to the discussion, and I really want to thank Bob on the front end for that. And uh, without further ado, I want to get to the substance and turn this over to Bob. Yes. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you, John. And thanks to you all for coming out uh, for a, such an interesting subject. It's a really great crowd. Thank you. Uh, the TPP is one of the most hotly debated trade deals in my long memory, reminding me of the NAFTA debate, which too loomed large in a presidential election. TPP is an amazing phenomenon. It started, as most of you know, with a group of four very small countries. The U.S. shouldered its way into this group, and it began to grow. Many in the trade community here thought U.S. engagement was a mistake, just another batch of puny economies, another CAFTA on which to spend political capital. Thanks to a few visionaries like Barbara Wiesel, the chief TPP negotiator, and a team of very able negotiators, including Christine Bliss, the TPP took root and grew like an oak to be the most comprehensive innovative trade agreement we have reached. In its last stages, Canada, Mexico, and Japan insisted on joining. Though, it, this, com though this complicated the deal, it raised the sta stakes because TPP now includes almost every major economy in the Pacific Rim, China notably excluded. A lot of people think TPP is a strategic imperative and a lot of, a lot of others disagree. There's no doubt that it is very important. Whether we join or don't, it will transform the economy of the Pacific Rim. If we don't join it now and the others go ahead, we could perhaps well find ourselves fighting to get in later. Our panelists are really great, but what moderator is not going to say that? This is a great group. We hope they will give you the basis for making your own decisions about TPP. We'll begin with Jason Kearns, Chief Trade Counsel of the House Ways and Means Committee, Trade Subcommittee, a highly respected and effective a uh, staff member who helped shape policy and law on the Democratic side of the aisle. Jason, you'll find, is a thoughtful and articulate opponent of the deal as it stands. Next, we'll hear from Christine Bliss, president of the Coalition of Service Industries, Services Industries, 
representing a wide array of services sectors. Christine will discuss benefits of TPP from the services perspective as well as areas where additional work needs to be done. She served as Assistant USTR for Services and Investment until March 1st this year. Next we'll hear from Jim Fothery, who is Executive Director, Japan and Korea for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He recently assumed a role as co-lead for the Chamber's work as Executive Coordinator of the U.S. Coalition for TPP, a broad coalition co-chaired by the Chamber, the Business Roundtable, the NAM, Farm Bureau, Emergency Committee for American Trade, et cetera. Um, then we'll finally have, to create some perspective, an outstanding economist, Dr. Pietro Rivoli, is Professor of Economics at the Dennis School of Business at Georgetown. She is widely published, and her job today is to bring a professional, non-political, if that's possible, reference point for this discussion. Each will have five to seven minutes to begin, then we'll turn to you for your questions and discussion. Before beginning, I have to establish now that Jason's remarks will be off the record. You can listen, but you cannot record or quote or cite his remarks. Thank you, and let's get started. <coughs> Center for inviting me to part be part of today's panel. Really appreciate it. Um, in giving my perspective on TPP and services, I, I think it's important to highlight that the U.S. is the most competitive supplier of international services in the world. Um, we at the Coalition of Service Industries recently released our annual services export update, which revealed that in 2014, U.S. companies exported more than $680 billion in services, resulting in a surplus of nearly a quarter trillion dollars. And what's, I think, most important is that this represents an increase of 74 percent over an eight-year period, if you look from 2006 to 2014. And this rise in services exports is happening across the country. It's not in just isolated in certain pockets. We found that in 46 states, each of them exported at least a billion dollars. Um, and so, as you can see, it's not an isolated phenomena, and it's happening across the country. And these services exports are supporting 4.6 million U.S. jobs. And um, as Jason noted, certainly if you look at specific parts of where those services exports are concentrated, particularly in the business services sector, the wages in those services jobs are at least 20 percent higher than man the average manufacturing job. So they are good high wage jobs that are being created. And services have a far more um, pervasive effect than just looking at exports, because they're enablers virtually of every sector in the economy. Manufacturing and agriculture both depend on services, such as banking, insurance, engineering, and communications to achieve their production and income goals. And at the very heart of what's going on in this services enabling role, our data flows and the expansive use of data and digital tools to conduct business. So it's critical that trade roles in TPP and other agreements governing services and digital trade keep up with all the technological advances that enable cross-border data flows, global value chains, innovative business models, products, and services. Now looking at TPP specifically, even though the U.S. is the world's leading services exporter, it has tremendous scope to expand those services exports. Services accounts for 80 percent of value, ad at value added in the U.S. economy, but only 30 percent of U.S. trade. So as you can see, there is huge scope for expansion there. And TPP can help the U.S. US realize this potential by expanding market access to the collective TPP population of roughly 480 million and its GDP of roughly 11 trillion. What are the key provisions for services trade in TPP? First, there's the cross-border services chapter 
that provides binding disciplines on things like national treatment, MFN, prohibits the requirement of a local, establishing a local presence in order to provide your service. It also prohibits limits on the number of ser services suppliers or the number of employees in a given service sector. And most importantly, these obligations are applied on what's called a negative list basis. And that means that they apply to all services across the board, except where a country has taken very specific exceptions. This chapter also contains very important disciplines for the express delivery service to assure fair competition as it competes with particularly state-owned enterprises, particularly postal, state-owned postal entities. The second part of TPP that's critical to services is the e-commerce chapter. Now, with the exception of the carve-out of financial services, which I'll discuss toward the conclusion of my remarks, the e-commerce chapter is one of the most important achievements of TPP because it contains the first ever binding obligations with respect to free flow of data and no local server requirements. Together, these provisions will allow companies to offer a cloud computing and other internet-based services. The e-commerce chapter also requires that parties develop frameworks to protect personal privacy. And this is critically important because privacy concerns have been one of the major impediments to agreement on protecting the flow of data across borders. The chapter is also the first trade agreement to call for cooperation on cybersecurity, another area of concern that has prevented governments from reaching agreement in this critical area. The next chapter of TPP that is very important to services is the financial services chapter. And positive provisions worth noting in that chapter include strong binding disciplines on postal entities selling insurance. And why this is important is it creates a level playing field for US insurers who find themselves too frequently, particularly in Japan, in competition with state-owned postal entities. And this is also an area of concern in countries like Vietnam. So Japan is the major concern, but a number of other TP parties as well. In addition, TPP also requires for the first time Countries must allow cross-border delivery of electronic payment services, which will secure market access for U.S. credit and debit card companies. The telecommunications chapter is also critical to services, and here it's the first trade agreement that will extend pro-competitive network access rules to mobile su service suppliers. And this is important because mobile service suppliers, because they haven't been subject to those rules, have been able to hinder competition, particularly in TPP markets. In addition, the investment chapter provides important protections to services suppliers who want to establish abroad in the form of core protections such as national treatment, the minimum standard of treatment, prohibitions on performance requirements such as tech transfer and required use of local technology, and also expropriation. And finally, the SOE state-owned entities chapter is the first trade agreement to expand disciplines for state-owned enterprise, and it includes requiring non-discrimination in all purchases and sales by SOEs. It has transparency rules and requires impartial regulations. Now, I've cataloged a number of areas where we see considerable benefits for services, but I would be remiss if I didn't note the areas where we see the need for improvement. The first area I would highlight is the carve-out of financial services from the benefit of the e-commerce chapter. Under, financial, uh, under TPP, financial services suppliers will have no protection from forced data localization requirements, which will put them at a considerable commercial and security disadvantage. 
The second area I would highlight where we can see the need for improvement is the TPP SOE disciplines. And here I would highlight that the definition of an SOE requires that at least 50% of the entity must be directly owned by the state. And we think this is a very high threshold and a lower threshold would be more appropriate. So in conclusion, as I said, we see considerable areas of benefits, potential for benefits under the TPP, but we also need areas that need further improvement. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Thank you very much. Jim? Okay. Um, I'm going to take the question head on and turn it around a bit. I'm, I'm going to postulate that the critics are wrong and that approving the TPP is in the U.S. interest. And it's, uh, to simply put, TPP would place us at the center of the evolving Asia-Pacific economic and, and security order. In our geostrategic interest, TPP will solidify the well-known or referred to rebalance to Asia or the pivot, if you will. But also it underpins alliances that we currently have with Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. There's economic strength there that goes with our overall security relationship. I'm an economic and trade guy, so I really would like to highlight the economic impact of TPP. And I think the critical point here is that TPP will cement the U.S. presence in Asia in the Asian economic architecture. Trade agreements in Asia are proliferating, literally proliferating by the dozens, if, if not more. We have agreements with only Australia, Singapore, and Korea in the Asia-Pacific region. We're not part of any regional negotiations or an existing regional agreement. So the TPP is our big opportunity to get us uh, a central place in, TP in, in the Asia-Pacific region, which has been referred to, obviously, as the most dynamic high-growth region in the world. So that's critical. Um, TPP will provide major trade expansion opportunity for U.S companies, U.S. providers of industrial goods, high-tech goods, agricultural commodities, and as Christine mentions, services. On the goods side, immediately 77 percent of tariffs will be eliminated, and over time, 99 percent of tariffs will be eliminated under TPP. USTR frequently refers to the, the 18,000 tax cuts that will come under TPP. That's not full elimination, but they will be eliminated or substantially reduced over time. In some cases, it's going to take um, 15 years or more to eliminate some of the tariffs, but um, that's a major change. And with global, global trade slowing, uh, anything to reduce tariff barriers is a big deal. Uh, the aforementioned Peter Petri study from Brandeis or Peterson Institute estimates that the U.S. by 2030 will get $130 billion in, in net income gains annually and also uh, $350 billion in export gains annually. Um, as Christine referred to, the barriers to services exports are also quite substantial in Asia-Pacific countries as well as other places around the world. TPP will significantly address many of these barriers, as Christine said. Um, I would agree with her. The U.S. stands to gain more than any other country from the elimination or the reduction of services barriers um, because of the competitiveness of our service sector. And that includes financial services, but also our, our information technology companies, um, our entertainment companies, et cetera. Uh, so there are great opportunities there. Again, Petri estimates that the U.S. would achieve or, or potentially realize $149 billion annual increases in services exports by 2030, again, the most of any country because we are the most competitive service economy. Uh, the third thing I would highlight is that the bilateral deal with Japan, and I don't know if you, you probably know this, but if you don't, there's the overall TPP architecture among the 12, and then there's a separate parallel deal with Japan, which addressed a number of specific issues, including Japan Post, including autos, including a number of other things. Under the, under the combination of the overall deal and the bilateral, we think that there are enormous opportunities for U.S. exporters of industrial goods, technology goods, agricultural goods in particular, because Japan is going to eliminate or reduce substantially over time some very high tariffs on U.S. agricultural exports, such as beef, et cetera. Um, so that's a great opportunity for us. It will also, I think, help underpin continued Japanese confidence and, and the strength of the relationship 
that we have with Japan. Japanese investment flows into the United States have been among the highest of any economy in the last few years. They provide hundreds of thousands of U.S. jobs, and that actually helps supplement U.S. exports uh, and employs workers in manufacturing facilities that are Japanese-owned, auto industry, chemical industry, you name it. Um, so that's the, the immediate tariff elimination. I think over time, ultimately, the, the biggest gains actually may come from the rules changes um, and the higher standards that are embedded in many of the key parts of TPP. Um, this is what I would call the 21st century agenda. And this gets to the non-tariff measures that um, have been mentioned, but they're frequently the biggest problem that American companies face in trying to do business abroad, particularly in the service industries, but in, in industrial areas as well. So some of the key areas, and I don't want to repeat too much of what Christine said, but the e-commerce digital trade has some groundbreaking provisions, uh, elimination of tariffs on, on digital goods, protects source code and technology choice neutrality, which is important for our technology companies. As she said, it enables cross-border data flows. Um, the ban on server localization for tech companies is actually a really good deal. It's not um, for the financial services, which were excluded from that, and I think she can address that better than I can in Q&A. Uh, secondly, intellectual property provisions in TPB uh, substantially improve trade secret, trademark, and copyright protection, including for the first time in a trade agreement criminal penalties for trade secret theft. We are a, an IP-based economy more and more, so this is a very significant thing for U.S. companies across a range of industries. Um, there are significant provisions on pharmaceuticals, something referred to as patent linkage and patent extension. Uh, the problem here, as we, I think, all know, is that there was not um, the provisions on data protection for biologics weren't at the high standard that that the industry needs. It's one of our most competitive industries, and clearly there are members of Congress that are concerned about that. So that's something that I will put in the to-be-addressed category, as Christine did. Customs and trade facilitation provides better Im information for companies that are exporting into market. It helps reduce the time it takes to get goods into the market once they land at the port. That's all good stuff. Uh, there was not, unfortunately, any uh, provisions for cross-TPP de minimis standards, which would have been something that would help, I think, overall. Uh, another critical area, competition policy and SOEs. Um, we see this as an important start. It's not, the, it's not the end game, but I think if you look in Asia, competition policy is increasingly being used in some ways as industrial policy uh, to provide preferential or and advantageous treatment of domestic companies. So we think with the new procedural rules that are established in TPP and some other provisions, this is a significant improvement over the existing standards. Uh, also some language there pertaining to cooperation among competition <coughs> authorities, which already happens but I think can be enhanced under this. And then finally for our agricultural community, uh, it's not tariff issues but frequently it's, it's SPS rules, phytosanitary rules. Um, this actually has been described as groundbreaking because it does a number of things. There's a new rapid reporting system that would be put in place. There's greater use of science-based standards and risk analysis. There's a cooperative technical consulting system that's been placed, uh, put into place or would be put into place. And there's a dispute settlement procedure that would apply specifically to SPS rules. We're the major agri agricultural exporting economy in the world or one of them. So this is actually a very big deal for our, our farm producers. Um, I can come back to the to labor and environment and currency provisions if you want, but just a, a couple of short comments. Um, we would say that the TPP provisions on labor actually help defend against the so-called race to the bottom um, because it does help elevate the labor standards among the 12 countries that have agreed to this. There are new protections that are put in place consistent with the May 10 standards, as Jason said. Uh, there are provisions regarding mi minimum wages. Now, these are pegged to local conditions, but but that's something uh, not to be kind of tossed away very easily. And there's dispute settlement. And as Jason said, there's labor <coughs> consistency plans with Brunei, Malaysia, Vietnam, which I think are, are significant. Um, he mentioned that there's not one with Mexico, so I think that's something that people are concerned about. But I think at least with those other three economies, these are good moves. Um, the environmental obligations regarding subsidies, overfishing, 
uh, trafficking and trade in wildlife and, and illegal logging. Those are all, I think, new provisions and trade agreements that are, that are good, positive moves. The currency provisions, they're not enforceable provisions in, in, on currency. Uh, there is a new mechanism that was agreed to in a side agreement that will provide a consultative mechanism for the 12 countries to talk about macroeconomic policy and to talk specifically about exchange rates as necessary. Um, that's not obviously something that, that people that have criticized currency manipulation think is sufficient, but it's something that is meaningful and it does have substance and um, it's, it's, a good, it's a good start. We completely agree that current ma currency manipulation has been a problem in global trade. There's no doubt about that. It's just a question of how you address it. So to conclude, um, I, I would say this. The TPP is not perfect. There's a complexity of issues and a diversity of members that I think made it difficult for us to get the highest standards that we have achieved in some of our other trade agreements. But the old saying, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the very good in this case. And I think that's really the point. On balance, this is a strong agreement that will reduce tariffs, it will advance higher standards and new rules, and it will cr create better conditions for U.S. companies in Asia, where we are being outpaced because of the proliferation of trade agreements and the growing influence of China. Um, there are problems that need to be addressed to get the full support from the, the wider business community and from certain members, uh, you know, a number of members of Congress. I want to be perfectly clear about that. First is biologics, and I think that that's been well established. Um, financial services, as Christine said, is also another major issue that affects a wide number of companies. So I think there are ways that they can deal with that, and I, I trust that that's going on. Um, <laughs> Lastly, I just want to emphasize that there would be major cost of us not approving the TPP. First is that U.S. companies, ag producers, and our workers will be at a disadvantage. Australia, Chile, and others have free trade agreements with Japan. They will be able to export to Japan their beef, their wine, their agricultural products um, at a substantial advantage to us over uh, the existing tariff levels, which are 38.5 percent on beef. So Australia will cut that in half over time, and we'd be at a very major disadvantage. Secondly, China is capturing more and more market share in the region, uh, and it is setting the rules and it's setting lower standards. There's a competing regional agreement called the RCEP. We're not party to that. China and India are. That's widely viewed as being a, uh, a lower standard agreement that would not meet the same kind of needs that we have in the U.S., and that would be the, the standard by default if we can't agree on the TPP. And then finally, we've got growing competition from the EU, uh, who's negotiating bilaterals or trying to with Japan, Vietnam, and other countries. So we want to maintain or not be put at a disadvantage. So the bottom line, we would lose credibility in the region if we can't conclude it. Our exporters will be out of opportunities and, and market opportunities, and China will expand its strategic and economic influence even further. So net, it's in our interest to do this deal. Okay, Jim. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, thank you. Put this on. Okay. Uh, so what Bob had asked me to talk about was to step back a little bit to uh, to look at the forest and talk about some of the economic research that's been done <laughs> on the predicted impacts of TPP. Um, I'll start by saying this is really difficult. This is a very difficult um, predictive exercise to try to affect. Uh, try to predict the aggregate economic as well as the employment and distributional effects of TPP. Uh, the reason uh, that it's so technically difficult is that so much of the action in TPP is in the reduction of non-tariff barriers. So if you're trying to predict a change in employment or demand, uh, reducing a tariff is a fairly, it's a fairly simple matter to try to trace through the effects of that because it's, a, it's an effect directly on the price. But when you're trying to uh, estimate the demand and trade effects of a reduction in these non-tariff barriers, uh, the, the, the results um, are much squishier. The assumptions you have to make um, may be more unrealistic. So all that is to say, uh, that when you look at this research, uh, I think it's a lot harder to do it for TPP than it has been for some of the earlier agreements that were, um, where most of the action was in, was in tariffs and quotas. 
Um, there have been a few, probably half a dozen studies over the recent past that have tried to um, predict the effects of TPP on the U.S. economy. Uh, these models differ in their predicted effects. So uh, what Bob was interested in, I think, is some summary that I might be able to provide about why and how these predicted effects are, are different and kind of what um, these economists agree on and, and where they have some differences. So let me start by saying that all of these half a dozen studies uh, and many more that relate to trade liberalization more generally um, do not take issue with the underlying forces of, of comparative advantage. So with or without TPP, there are underlying forces of comparative advantage uh, at work because the U.S. is an open economy. So none of these studies are suggesting that the direction of these forces would be altered by TPP. Uh, the U.S. does have a strong comparative advantage in knowledge-intensive services. It is losing ground in labor-intensive manufacturing. These are long-term trends that are not going to be altered uh, by this or other trade agreements. Uh, I think that the studies also agree that TPP in aggregate is going to widen the channel for the consequences of this existing comparative advantage. So there is something happening out there that results from our labor endowments, our capital endowments, our, our skill intensities and so forth. Um, TPP, I think, um, all of these studies would agree will amplify that um, slightly. I think that the, it's also fair to say there is, there is an exception out there in the, in the published work, but it's also fair to say that all of the studies agree to a net positive impact on aggregate income, on GDP. So they agree that it is small relative to all kinds of different measures, but they agree that it's, that it's positive. There's also widespread agreement about the likelihood of concentrated losses, okay? and those losses will take place in those same sectors that have been under pressure for, for decades now. Um, so that, I think, uh, gets to where the agreement is, okay? Small increases in aggregate output or GDP, concentrated losses. Uh, now, the problem, I think, with a lot of this research is that the e economists keep trying to answer the question that they think people should be asking. Okay? Um, the question that most economists think that we should be asking is about this effect on aggregate income. You know, will this make the country richer overall? Okay. Uh, the problem that we're facing now in the, in the policy debates and in the, the political debates is that's not really the question that people are asking about TPP or about trade more generally. So, um, so I think, you know, the profession has to, you know, to try to start to wrestle with the questions that are being asked rather than the questions that you know, we would like people to ask. So the questions that are being asked uh, relate to, first of all, the distributional consequences of trade liberalization generally, and also uh, how exactly adjustment works for people who are on the downside of trade liberalization. Okay? And I think, um, you know, a reading of this literature, literature suggests that, you know, these are bigger puzzles in economics that we haven't cracked, and so therefore we can't very well crack the trade piece of it. So for example, we have an inequality puzzle in the United States. You know, we know that inequality has been growing. We have a, a related productivity puzzle. We know that wage growth has not kept pace with labor productivity growth. So these are bigger puzzles in economics. Uh, and because we don't have this thing figured out, it's very difficult to crack the question of how trade affects those things as well. So the studies make different assumptions about these things that we just don't fully understand. So in the Petri study that's been mentioned, um, for example, 
there is an embedded assumption that the productivity improvements from trade will flow through to wages. Okay? Uh, in some of the other studies, they make uh, a very contrary assumption. But again, uh, this isn't something that we can settle without having a bit more, uh, a lot more research on the, the underlying phenomenon. Um, there are a number of channels by which trade liberalization can affect income inequality. Some of those channels uh, would predict a reduction in inequality. Some of those channels would predict an increase. Um, I think that probably my own take on the most um, sophisticated of this research would suggest a small increase in inequality resulting from trade liberalization. But trade is a very small bit player in the overall phenomenon. You know, we know that there are much more important forces at work in inequality, in particular related to you know, changes in technology and the matchup of that technology with, with worker skills. So different assumptions, um, because we don't know the whole answer, are leading to these different conclusions. Um, on adjustment, you know, a critical question when we try to think about um, especially local impacts is what happens when uh, a worker is displaced from in import competition. Okay. Uh, again, the studies agree that there's going to be a little bit more of that under TPP. So what do we know about this adjustment process, I think, is a, you know, is a, is a really important question for, for the research. The studies out there have made some polar opposite assumptions about this. Okay? The, the Petri study basically, uh, as, as uh, Jason noted, does assume this full employment picture where the labor market is flexible to absorb um, workers laid off in one place are quickly reabsorbed somewhere else. Um, the Tufts study actually makes the polar opposite assumption and says that you know, these jobs are kind of going to disappear for good. There's almost like an assumption of sort of permanent unemployment. Um, you know, most people looking at that would see, you know, something unrealistic on either end of that, right? So it seems that a reasonable approach is going to be that there is um, something that we might call temporary unemployment. Um, we need to try to get under that to figure out who is affected, you know, what the consequences are, how much uh, regional concentration is going on, and so forth and so on. So again, we don't have a, a very good handle on what this adjustment process looks like. Um, however, I will say that there's a brand new uh, piece of excellent research um, by David Otor and his colleagues. Um, that I think is very relevant for TPP. So a lot of the good research we want to look at, you know, doesn't really relate to TPP in particular, but to trade liberalization more generally. And OTOR's study just out a couple um, weeks ago, really, uh, was able to actually quantify adjustment to, in particular, the trade liberalization that we experienced with China, China's int introduction into the WTO. And what he finds um, that I find pretty convincing is that the adjustment at the lower skill levels in the U.S. economy for people um, who have been displaced by trade is, is longer and tougher than we thought. Okay? Um, and some of his estimates go up to a 10-year, kind of a 10-year recovery period for some of these um, sectors and some of these regions. So that's kind of in between, you know, the Tufts and the Peterson uh, estimates, but it points to something, you know, a very serious, I think, policy concern that, that needs to be addressed. So to summarize, uh, we have broad agreement that I think there's a small aggregate uh, positive impact for GDP. Uh, we have broad agreement there are concentrated losses, particularly in labor-intensive manufacturing. Um, we have trickier research um, on the distributional consequences, inequality, um, and trickier uh, research on the adjustment for the workers who are negatively affected. Thanks. Thank you.
Um, could I take the liberty of asking a question of you, Dr. Piedra, Dr. Rivoli? Is it worth the trouble? Um, so, you know, I, I think I've thought about this a fair bit, and I guess where I come down on that is economics can only take us so far in this discussion, and I don't think it actually takes us very far at all. Okay? Um, I think that the distance is really in the um, the facilitation of the rules of doing business, okay? And there hasn't been much measurement of this by economists. So I think the reason I think it's worth doing is because of the negative effects of what we call the spaghetti bowl, you know, which just are these, if you haven't heard this term, it's a term by Jagdish Bhagwati at Columbia. And he basically says, you know, if you have a spaghetti bowl, you have just all these, you know, dozens of proliferating trade agreements, all with separate sets of rules. So for me, it's worth doing um, largely on the basis of the rationalization of that spaghetti bowl. Okay, um, is that enough to stimulate some questions? Um, I'll go to Matthew. When in doubt, go to Matthew. <laughs> uh, yeah, Matt Schultz, uh, US Trade. Oh, thank you. Cool, Mike. Um, uh, <laughs> question for Ms. Bliss. Uh, Two questions. So, um, Secretary Liu has been testifying up on the Hill recently and holding open the possibility that there could be a, some sort of side letter, side agreement to TPP that would address the financial services localization issue, but also sort of downplaying that possibility while at the same time saying that the real question is how we're going to address this going forward. Um, so, I guess uh, I just wanted to know. Uh, you know, does that make you worried that the administration is only going to solve this problem going forward and not in the TPP? And, you know, on a related question, you know, there's a big, big focus on biologics uh, in a lot of the, the debate, you know, the narrow trade debate here inside the Beltway, some on financial services. But are you also worried that, um, you know, if the administration has to go back to its TPP partners and renegotiate one thing, that they would pick biologics and not financial services. Well, with respect to your first question, um, I think we were, you know, we were mildly encouraged by the comments of Secretary Liu and, and hopeful um, that it reflected uh, was a further reflection of the constructive discussions that have been going on um, with the administration. Um, and uh, I think as to your question, we would certainly hope that the administration would seriously consider steps to address the issue in the context of, of TPP. Um, but I think we, you know, I, I think we don't know the answer to that. I think so at, at this point, um, the request is certainly to address the issue both in the context of future agreements and with respect to, to TPP, understanding that Ambassador Froman has said that the agreement itself is closed. Um, the other part of your question, um, I think, again, goes back to really the same thing, and that is that we think the discussions that have been going on with the administration have been positive. Um, we think that there is a real attempt to try and find a solution. Um, and so I think we would continue to look at it in that light as opposed to um, seeing the issue being in competition with, with other um, issues that are also being worked on. Okay, right here. Can you identify yourself, please? Hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, my question is for both of the business representatives. Um, so when you talk about, you know, working with the administration on resolving your concerns with CPP, um, you know, is there sort of a, an urgency in, in how quickly that needs to get done? And, and specifically, um, you know, is this something that would 
um, you would like to see resolved by the time the ITC finishes its report so that you know the bill can get submitted to Congress? Is, is there any sort of, um, I guess, timeline that you're kind of bumping up on in terms of how quickly the administration needs to do that? Uh, well, I would just say, I don't, I don't think, you know, from our perspective, we have a self-imposed timeline. I think, you know, we would like to see a positive solution as soon as possible. Um, but I don't think um, we're looking at any particular benchmark um, because we want to get it right. Um, so uh, I guess the, the best answer I could give is as soon as possible. Um, but a good result at the same time. Um, what she said. Please. Uh, no. Um, I, I think seriously, substance is is important for the timing here, and I think it, it's. I think she's exactly right. It's got to. It's got to be the right details and the right mechanisms, whatever those are going to be, and I think that will determine how quickly this stuff can move. Right here. Hi, Kevin Chavez from Derek Kilmer's office. Uh, question for Dr. Rivoli on the ITC study, um, and, and others too, if you feel like you have a role to play in this too. Um, what do you expect in terms of its structure, um, its um, design? Um, wh where do you place in terms of its past analysis on trade agreements like this? Uh, in terms, is it going to split the baby between these competing studies? I mean, there's, there's a lot of studies out there, and it's hard for folks to figure out exactly which ones use the right metrics. Microphone, Dr. Rivoli. So the original criticism uh, of the ITC study, which I don't think is going to go away, is this full employment assumption, which is the same that was um, is still in the, the Peterson study, although there has, was a recent update where they tried to incorporate some adjustment costs. Um, but I think, and I've heard this from, I believe, um, well, I think Jason just mentioned it. You know, it's one of the things that Senator Levin is worried about. So I think that they have to address this full employment assumption. Um, but that's going to be very difficult to do. That's going to be because we still, again, don't understand the adjustment mechanism as well as we need to. Anybody on this side? Go. My name is Stanley Nolan. I'm at Georgetown Business School colleague of Pietro Rivoli's. Thank you for being um, here. Uh, thank you, Pietro, for giving us this latest reading of empirical um, research. Uh, but you know, <clears throat> theorists, as well as I think Main Street intuition, already knows this. There are uh, distributional consequences. This is not news with any free trade agreement. It's true. So. How, how, do we, how do we weigh those up? It's not in the end, and, and, and I would say, Patrick, economists know what the answer is, but they don't have a vote in the Congress, and members of Congress are gonna vote on the basis of something else. It's about how do you value the losses against the gains? We know there are gains in total, and some people lose. How do you set one against the other and make a decision? So the most recent update to the Peterson Institute study estimates, I think I have Jesus. this right here, um, based on some earlier survey data, that a ballpark loss figure is that <coughs> a laid off manufacturing worker um, is gonna lose over his lifetime because it was a sample of middle-aged men, I believe it was 1.4 times their annual income, which plugging in some numbers gets you to a number of something like $60,000. Probably a conservative estimate, uh, but let's take that $60,000. Okay. Uh, what Stanley is pointing out is how do you weigh that $60,000 loss against the aggregate gains? So the Peterson study um, I think is going to find aggregate gains of something under $100 per person for the U.S. population. So basically we have aggregate gains of a small amount 
uh, that we have to weigh against these concentrated gains of a large amount. Econ and ec this, is, this was my point earlier. Economics cannot help with that because to an economist, a dollar is a dollar. Okay? However, to most voters, you know, one person, 60,000 people losing one dollar uh, is less bad than one person losing $60,000. But economics does not have a calculus to make that trade-off. And that's why, you know, again, I come back to this point that it can only take us um, so far. Now, of course, the standard economic response to this problem is that the winners should compensate the losers. And that's how you achieve trade liberalization buy-in. Um, what we know from many decades of observation is those mechanisms to compensate losers um, do not work very well even if uh, we assume that there is such a thing as a compensation for, you know, for example, a, you know, a community that has been hollowed out. So we don't have the apparatus in economics, <laughs> is my answer um, to Stan. You know, that is a question of values and policy and uh, political process. So we're having a very rational discussion. Does anybody want to comment further on John's question? <laughs> uh, maybe that would stir things up, but I'll try to stay rational. Do you have an answer? Do you have a response to John? Well, uh, yeah, we've had a great discussion in a very calm and rational environment, and I really appreciate uh, the way people have approached, you guys have approached this. But, you know, out on out in the streets, the, the mob is storming the Bastille. Robespierre, uh, Trump is uh, stirring things up. Uh, uh, the gentleman from Vermont is, is, is doing his share. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no defense at the presidential level of the long-established policy and benefits of free trade, as Christine pointed of trade, as Christine pointed out, there has been a 74% increase in is it exports of services or exports. services exports over the last eight years. What's been happening over the last eight years? We've been implementing trade agreements, so there is some, uh, with respect to the uh, to Dr. Rivley's observations, there is some empirical evidence that this economy has grown massively in the context since the Second World War of a free trade policy. And that just can't be ignored. I mean, we can go to the economics and say, well, the economics don't really, don't really support uh, that, 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 that trend, maybe, or that policy. But uh, um, it, it's, very, it's very hard to, um, to ignore that. On the other hand, um, I have a friend who's running for a congressional seat in the uh, sixth, uh, sixth District of Virginia. He's a very intelligent, bright, good man. Uh, the 6th District is suffering employment. His, he told me that, what, he asked me, what do I do when I go to Danville, Virginia, where <coughs> Dan River Mills has just closed down? What do I do when I go to this other town where, you know, the, the manufacturing base has gone to, uh, gone to um, uh, Mexico? What is the, well, how, do you, how does a candidate like that who wants to do the right thing, how is he going to respond? How is he going to vote? Um, how is he going to be able to explain to his constituents that his vote for trade might be the right vote in the long run? These guys aren't interested in the long run. They're interested in the, why they have to sell their, their, mess, their, their rundown house and, and move, maybe. So it's, it's really, uh, it really gets right down to, to the grassroots and the, and the sidewalks. What do we, how do we, in this environment, provide? TAA is paltry. But there's got to, we have to respond better. And I, believe me, I don't have the ideas, but uh, that's my little speech. Do you agree? <laughs> Any comment? No, it has to be bright green. Got it, okay. Uh, if we look at the components of national income, trade is the most volatile. So, you know, we have consumption, we have investment, we have government spending. So a dollar of trade income is a little bit different than a dollar of trade from other sources. So we all want higher income and free trade brings higher income, but that higher income that's trade generated looks a little bit different. It has more volatility in it, okay? Um, and so I think that what Main Street is picking up Okay, is that while there may be these aggregate benefits, there is more risk built into that way of, 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 of producing income. And you know what the Peterson Institute um, 
proposes is a kind of old idea that's been bouncing around but has never really been taken up, um, are, are various forms of wage insurance. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, you know, whether and, you know, to what extent that solves the issue in, in Danville, it's certainly a big step beyond traditional TAA because insurance, of course, is designed to deal with risk and trade does introduce new risks into the economy. So that's a partial answer, you know, how that plays mm -hmm. on, you know, Main Street is a, is a different question. Thanks. Okay, one last question, real quick. You. Hi, uh, Jack Caprol with Inside US Trade. I have a question for the <laughs> business representatives. Uh, and, you know, the debate outside the Beltway on trade is kind of either free trade could destroy a community's manufacturing base or you're in support of free trade. But within the Beltway, it kind of seems to be, well, if the biologics issue gets fixed, then members will vote for the agreement. And so what makes you think from an from a industry perspective that if your, your fix is, you know, if what's requested is actually fixed, that members will then have the political appetite to support the agreement? Well, I, I, I think the question that Bob asked and, and the professor's response here gets to a broader issue, and I think your question does as well. I mean, clearly we focus on particular aspects of the agreement uh, that are important for our globally competitive companies, and we know that those provisions will help those companies. I think it is a broader debate outside the Beltway that, that it's actually important and incumbent on us all to have from the academic world, from the private sector to the media to make sure that we're, we're actually reporting and, and discussing accurately, as, as accurately as possible, what the true impact of trade is versus I think what you refer to is what the impact of technology change is on, on employment in certain manufacturing industries. I just saw something this morning manufacturing employment in the United States is down 5 million from, from 2000. And I think our manufacturing output levels are, are the same or higher, and that's been done through automation and technology and, and other things. So clearly the world has changed, and I think our debate about trade and, and Jason's point about TAA and, and Bob's point about TAA, I think those are all valid points. It's a, it's a drop in the bucket in terms of what we need. The question is, can we design programs um, that will train people fast enough? And I think that's a major, major challenge. And I think even more broadly, job training programs, I've seen a number, there's some 47 US job training programs across the departments of labor and, and various other things. So I think for those of us that are pro-trade advocates, and I, I count myself as a very strong one, I think those are the kinds of things that we all have to start to think about, but I think the, you don't start to do that by trashing a trade agreement that does really, actually does have benefits or, or more broadly trashing trade in general because it's been, it's been good for the economy overall and it's been good for the world overall over the last 50 years or 60 years. Look at the, the rise in incomes in many poor countries. That, a lot of that's attributable to trade. Now, dealing with the dislocations is the, the, the nub of the question that you're asking and I think we all need to take a 21st century approach to this stuff and, and figure out with smart people like the professor here um, and, and smart Hill staffers like Jason how this stuff can be how made about me? more effective. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. Um, I, I would just add one, one thing very quickly. Um, because I, I agree with all my colleagues' comments. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that um, we need to be able to do um, in addition, and I go back to the services sector, is point to the fact that, um, as I said in my remarks, services accounts for 80% of the value added in the economy, but only 30% of U.S. trade. So there really is some untapped potential there. And again, you're, you know, I think all the comments apply to the analysis that needs to be done about how those benefits will manifest and maybe there, there need to be improvements in skill sets to fully take advantage of the services jobs that might be created by increased exports. But I think the point being that 
if the answer is no, then the opportunity to expand that 30% won't exist. It's an extremely important point, and uh, one that our colleague at Georgetown, Brad Jensen, has explored and documented in his book, and um, I wish we were here to, to, further, to further enlighten us. But um, hey, the, the next time somebody says uh, X number of jobs were lost due to manufacturing since 2000 or whenever, I wish they would say, why number of jobs, uh, many times greater, has been, uh, have been supplied by services. Services have more than compensated, more than compensated for losses in manufacturing jobs. And that is totally, that is ignored uh, all the time, especially by leading politicos. So anyway, we have had a great discussion. Um, it's really great to have you all here. We thank you. And we, we, we thank our guests. But before we leave, I want to thank Joe Kallenbeck from uh, Congressman Roskam's office for his help in organizing this thing. We couldn't, we couldn't do it unless we had the venue and, and the, uh, the skill of, of, of Joe to help us out. So uh, join me in thanking our panelists, please.